This is episode number 159. Today we're featuring artist John Hughes, and you're going to learn something new about color. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plein Air podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plein Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plen Air Podcast. I hope you've been trying to figure out how to get some painting done. The weather here has been kind of warm and then cold, kind of a strange winter. Anyway, I've managed to sneak out a couple of times, get some Plen Air works done, but I am finding myself in the studio just a little bit more. By the way, I don't mind either way. I like being outdoors, but I also like being in the studio. That's a beautiful thing. There's some looming deadlines you need to be aware of. Just today, I talked to two different people who happened to tell me they're planning on going to the Plen Air Convention this May in Denver, but they haven't yet booked. And I said, well, you know, maybe you want to get that done because first, the hotel's sold out. I think we've sold out two hotels now. Secondly, this is the biggest Plen Air Convention in history. As a result, we're way ahead of last year's sales by this time, and we don't have a lot of seats left. And then third, we always have to raise the price on Valentine's Day as we get closer to all those financial obligations that we've encountered. So that's just right around the corner. So there's a possibility there won't be a single seat left after February 14th. We always, on that deadline day, we always get a huge number of people who are signing on board. So we don't have a lot of seats left, so you want to get this done. Uh, we cannot expand. We cannot ex, uh, expand by adding more seats. And word is just getting out that Michael Lynch, the guy who taught most of the great painters live today, like Bill Anton and Bill Davidson and Matt Smith and others, well, he's coming to the convention. So that's something brand new. Anyway, uh, this is a monumental moment in plein air painting, especially this convention, because when you think about it, you got Scott Christensen, Kwong Ho, Jill Carver, Don Whitelaw, Daniel Sprick, Thomas Schaller, Ray and Peggy Roberts, Ken Sellas, uh, Albert Handel, and about 80 instructors in all by the time all is said and done. And so you need to get the registration done, which you can do now at plenairconvention.com. Also at the convention, Every year we award about $30,000 in cash prizes for the winners of the Plein Air Salon, and there are only about two bi-monthly competitions left, so you can win in any category and be entered into the final judging. So there's about 20 categories. Enter any of them. Some of them get a lot of entries. Some of them don't get a lot. And, of course, if you win one of the bigger slots, you're also entered. And there's some other prizes that come with that, but also there's a $15,000 cash prize in the cover of Plein Air magazine if you are the grand prize winner. And, of course, you get a lot of publicity out of that. Tom Hughes won last year, and it's been good for him. So, anyway, get that done at pleinairsalon.com. Also, well, a little tip the average person enters four different paintings each time. Each of the there's six bi-monthly competitions, and uh, they average uh, several categories. I think it's three categories, and so uh, the and, and some of the categories don't get a lot of entries, and so look for some that also you might be able to thrive in. But uh, and and of course the judges are different every time. So what one judge picks uh, or rejects one month, another judge might fall in love with. So enter at plenairsalon.com. Coming up after the interview, I'm going to be answering some art marketing questions in the marketing minute, including how to motivate yourself. But right now, let's get right to the interview with John Hughes. John Hughes, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Hello, Eric. Good to hear from you. Nice to hear from you, too. I, we should tell everybody that we uh, tried to record this once before. <laughs> and, 
And yeah, we had a hard time with my cell service at that time. Yeah, and uh, you, I, what was funny about it is that you, you were driving around trying to find a better signal and sitting in your car. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Well, it was frustrating for both of us, but uh, here we are. I'm here we the are. Now. <laughs> well, John, uh, for the people who uh, may not yet be familiar with you, and I'm sure that's not very many, but talk a little bit about what it is you do and and what's your your kind of your secret sauce or your superpower. Oh wow, superpower! Um, I think uh, well, what I do is I I'm a landscape painter and. But I also paint other things. I, I do like to paint uh, an occasional still life. I, I include people sometimes in my work. Uh, I not, a, not only paint landscapes, but I, I do enjoy going into the city and painting. Uh, I took a trip out to New York City about a year ago and uh, did a series of paintings out on the street there, and that was a lot of fun. I'll bet that was. I'm curious about that because um, I've never done that. I've I've painted in big cities like Paris, but never a big city in America. What was that experience like? You know, um, the thing about painting, well, I, I grew up in New York. That was the, the one thing that really drew me back there, and I've got family back there. So um, my dad was a New York City policeman. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I spent a little bit of time down in the city, and I learned to get an appreciation for the for the buildings down there um there's something about the city that almost feels like nature to me so um about a year ago i i decided i'm going to go back and i'm just going to um go out and just paint every day and uh had an opportunity to stay with my cousin out on city island and i would we would uh, my son and i would take the uh the train into the city each day and uh just we, I'd set up just about anywhere that something caught my eye. It might have been under the uh, L in the Bronx, uh-huh. or it could, you know we were down in uh, uh, Central Park and Washington Square. And uh, interesting thing about the city, though, is like um, I always thought that painting in the city would be tough with all the people because you know drawing a crowd and all that kind of stuff. And occasionally I would get a crowd watching from behind, but not very often. Actually, most of the time, people just uh, pass you by, they acknowledge you were there, or sometimes they wouldn't even act like they they saw an artist out on the street, you know, and uh, it was just interesting that way that I was I was not bothered very much at all by passers-by. Nothing faces kind of anybody in my... New York. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So that to, true. while we're talking about that, I think it might be good to... to just discuss the whole idea of how painters can deal with um, the idea of painting in a public place. Uh, you know, I've heard a lot of stories from a lot of painters who have things that they try to do. Like some painters are really bothered by the fact that other people are watching them. Uh, some yeah. people, some people don't want to be interrupted. Some people love to talk to people. What's your take on all this? Yeah, I um, when I when I first started going out doing uh, outdoor work um this was when i was an adult I, I actually started when i was a kid but uh when i got more serious i started going out and i had a an, an old volkswagen at the time and i pulled out the uh the front seat on the passenger side and i was so shy about going out and painting in front of people that i i was set up inside the car and uh, i did that for a couple of times until my back ached, and then I figured, <laughs> you know, I've got to get up and start standing, you know. <laughs> so I forced myself to get out and start painting in front of people. And um, I think, you know, just after a while, you just get used to it. I mean, you just have to put yourself in an uncomfortable position, you know, and uh, just make the make the growth, the emotional growth inside just by doing that, you know. Let me ask you. Then, oh, yeah. go ahead. No, let's go, go ahead. Uh, so let me put you in a different scenario and tell me how you handle this. Okay, so you're set up painting, and an artist walks up next to you and starts painting, and it's Richard Schmid <laughs> or Clyde Aspivig. What, yeah. what, 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 what do you do I've then? Never, <laughs> I've never had that happen, but I think what I would do then is I would, 
I would pack up my gear and watch. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had that happen. I was did you uh, really? Yeah, I well, it didn't quite happen like that. I I was uh, visiting with Richard Schmidt, and he said, "Let's go painting," and we went out into the garden and and set up. And he pulled up a lawn chair, and I I wanted to sit there and watch him. He says, "No, you're going to paint," yeah, and yeah. and I felt the pressure. And you know, he's he's looking out looking out over me. He's not giving me any feedback. He's just looking out <laughs> over me. And oh, uh, I think my hands were probably shaking. <laughs> that would be intimidating. Yes, I could see that happening. He's I, a, you know, an amazing artist. I, I think that um, to some extent, you know, this idea of painting with other people is, is such a positive. There's so many positive things. But do you ever find that um, you kind of lose your way because of the influences of those other people? You know, either because you're, uh, you're nervous about them seeing what you're doing, or maybe you peek at what they've done and it gives you a new idea and you start changing things? You know, I I get encouragement from watching what other people are doing sometimes. Uh, but, but truthfully, when I do go out and paint with other artists, it, it, it's usually one of, of two scenarios. Either we walk away for, far enough from each other to where we're not even, you almost start wondering, why am I painting with other people when we don't, paint together you know yeah so the last time i went out with a few of my friends we actually set up next to each other and we were painting and uh, it was great because you know the whole time we're just carrying on conversations about art and stuff like that but uh, as far as um being influenced while i'm painting in that situation Usually we're we're too engrossed in our conversations to, and every once in a while somebody will stop and they'll come around and they'll look you know yeah. and make a comment but uh, usually it's you know it's something it's more of a positive thing than a negative thing. Well, I've I've had people who who told me that they didn't come to the plein air convention because they were intimidated by painting in front of other people because they're not yet very accomplished or, or they don't feel yeah. as though they are. What would you say to people like that? You know, I think the way to, to get over that, I mean, it, at least in my own uh, experience, is um, getting into the moment, you know, and getting into the process of painting. I think sometimes we, we all get this thing where uh, we have to have this finished product, you know, and what is this painting going to look like when it's done? And uh, instead of thinking that way, just think about the um, the problems in front of us. You know, like uh, what what's the value? What's what's the, uh, the coloration or the temperature of something I'm painting? And really get into that, and just just uh, sort of get into that Zen moment. I, you know, that's uh, that's something that's really important to me. And I think if you get into the process and, and, and quit worrying about what it's going to turn out like, it's like the uh, the pressure goes away, you know. Yeah, you I, I think it, it also if you, yeah, you just kind of focus on the idea that I'm not necessarily trying to make a masterpiece here. I'm trying to learn something or I'm trying to, you know, uh, get some experience on a particular, like you say, process. I think yeah, that yeah. that's valuable. I, I yeah. also... It, I also say, you know, we've all been there. I mean, how many times in your life before you got to a point where you were happy with your work, how many hundreds of paintings have you done that you would not want to show anybody? Oh, gosh, you know, I mean, there's paintings out there that sold maybe 30 years ago that I I wouldn't want to show anybody. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, seriously, I mean, we, we all have to... Um, grow and we have to start somewhere and uh you know you look back at your your past paintings and i mean i i had stacks and stacks of them in the studio and there came a time where i either had to um reprime them you know and uh, paint over them or i would take them in and cut them up on the table saw and make coasters out of them so yeah there's a there's a lot of uh, failures i guess you could say maybe not failures, but a lot of, uh, you know, experiences like that, that, uh, you know, you don't want to, um, you don't want to show anybody, but it's part of your, part of your process, you know, nobody starts out doing great work. 
So. Well, you know that's an that's an interesting dilemma because you, you know once in a while you'll you'll I'll go to a collector's house. I get to do that a lot because of my job, and you'll see you know they'll say, hey, I want you to see my you know my Monet or my you uh-huh. know whatever. And I I actually went to a guy's house the other day, a pretty significant collector, and and he had a painting that he really really wanted me to see, and it was awful. And I thought, you know, this is exactly what happens. You've got a stack of paintings that you don't ever want to show anybody, and then you keel over and die. And <laughs> somebody comes, you know, a, a family member comes along, puts them all out into the market, and, you know, that sure. was never your intention. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, but, and, but and it is nice. It is nice to look backwards uh, because, you know, you need to keep a couple of them. Because oh, when, yeah. Because yeah. otherwise you won't see how far you've come. That's true. And, and sometimes even when you go back and you look at some of those ones that were maybe not the best, you know, and maybe they were what you would consider a complete failure, sometimes there's things that you're doing, you were doing back then that uh, can inspire you e- even now. You know, maybe you've changed quite a bit and... Uh, there were things that you were doing in your early stages that are maybe uh, maybe even better in some ways than what you're doing now, and you kind of reconnect with that. Well, and you can also use those as studies, even though they may not be what you would do today. You can still you can kind of remember the spot, use that as stimulation, and, and do a painting from them. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, everything, uh, everything we've done goes into what we are now. I'm looking at a painting right now. I'm, uh, it's an old field study of mine that uh, I'm over at a friend's house because I don't have a landline so he's got one of my studies here and I haven't seen it in years and uh, I'm just going wow you know that wasn't too bad back then <laughs> you know? he's he's one of the few people in America that still have a landline uh, yeah that's right yeah. so John uh, to, to the point about things you know we, we all go through these phases um, you know when I started painting uh, I, I wanted to make my paintings look like photographs. You know, right. nobody, no, right. nobody ever told me that you weren't supposed to do that. And I, actually there's probably not a weren't supposed to any time. Anybody should do what they want to do. But, uh, yeah. do you find, uh, patterns with young painters or maybe not young age, but new painters, do you find patterns of things that they do that they eventually need to grow out of? Yeah, I think that being too literal, like you, like you said, you know, is is a, is a problem. I think in my own growth uh, as a painter, I uh, I was very literal at the beginning. I can think of a a painting that my mother-in-law has that uh, every once in a while I'll go over there, and she'll go, "Wow, isn't that painting great?" And I'm like, "I just want to hide under the table because." There's a there's a tree in this painting that I I think I literally tried to put every single leaf on the tree into the <laughs> painting, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know it's uh, so after a while, you know I think uh, as you grow you start to see patterns instead of uh, details you start to see patterns and design you know and that becomes more important than uh, than the than the details so um, yeah we I think we all do it and we all have paintings that were we'd be ashamed to show now, but, uh, like you said, it's part of our growth and it's who we are. So now, and, and, and in, in terms of those kinds of things, do you, what about color? Um, are there things that commonly are, that might be considered common mistakes in color? Um, well, I think the, the problem, mostly the problem that artists have with color would probably be value related getting the value wrong yeah and of, of course you know um the old saying that if the value is wrong the color's wrong so I, i'd say that would be the biggest thing right there yeah well i know when i started painting i would you know if i stood out on a sunny day and the grass was that glowy chartreuse green you know i made my grass that glowy chartreuse green but it never read well in a painting yeah. And yeah. Yeah. so how do you handle greens? 
So with greens, I, I guess like anything else, I try to um, incorporate the, the, the green into the rest of the landscape. Or in other words, it's got to have some sort of commonality with, let's say, the reds or the yellows or the blues or the violets or whatever. Um, that, that green can't exist in isolation, you know, um, in the painting. So as long as it harmonizes in some way, with the rest of the painting, you know, it, it's uh, it's probably going to work. So, but that would, you know, when when I think of green, um, there's so many um, flavors of green, you know, and uh, I think there's uh, a lot of red and green that's important, you know, and, um, like with a pine tree or something like that, and um, there's a lot of red in that in that green that makes it more of an olive green than a, than a viridian type green. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that was something that very early on somebody taught me to do. And it's kind of a habit I've stuck with is that I'd always take whatever green, whatever shade of green I'm doing, whether it's a bright yellowy green or, or something else, I'd always take it just a touch of cad red and drop it in there and kind of, and it kind of grays it back a little bit because it's the compliment. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I used to have viridian on my palette. I don't currently, and and I think it's a great color, but um, that's one of the thing with with uh, you know especially like the phthalos. Oh my goodness, you know you put a phthalo green out there, and boy that can just take over. It's like like popsicle green, you know, and uh, I, it's that addition of red, like you said, that really uh, helps out. And do you do you use phthalo colors? You know, I don't. Uh, the thalos, to be honest with you, they scare me. They they just get into everything. They do, and, and I don't know what it is, but they it's like they get on your clothes, they get on your car seat, they get everywhere. But <laughs> but uh, yeah. but you know, the, I think I think what it is is they seem to have such power, such tinning power. We're yeah. we're used to grabbing a pile of paint and mixing it into something, and with that, you just really need a you know almost like the tip of a pencil, and you get some pretty incredible mixing power. Yeah, the tinting strength on the thalos is just unbelievable. So, yeah, I've kind of I've kind of shied away from the thalos. I I have a cerulean blue. It's actually a cerulean blue hue in the Utrecht brand that I like, um, and I like it better than their cerulean pure because it's not so overpowering. But it it gives me that if I want a real strong green, I can pop a little bit of that viridian in there, and that uh, it, that'll do the job. So, what blues do you have on your palette? So, my palette is um, basically a warm and a cool primary palette. So, I have a cer- that cerulean bu- blue hue, and then I've got ultramarine blue. So, the the cool and the warm. And then, on the reds, I've got um, alizarin crimson and cadmium red medium. And for the yellows, I've got lemon yellow and cadmium yellow. Uh, medium, and then I throw a couple of toners on there, um, yellow ochre and burnt sienna. So, but I'm always thinking in terms of triads. It's always uh, when I mix colors, it's always about triads. Can you explain that to somebody who might not w- know what that means? So, uh, just basically, um, when I think about, uh, let's say, I'm, I'm mixing that that green, you know. And I start out, I need a dark color, so I'll go for the ultramarine blue. And then I'll, I'll, maybe I'll throw in the cadmium yellow medium. But if, if that's too green in any way, I'll, I'll pop in that third color, the red. And uh, even, with the, uh, even with the earth colors that I have on the palette, you know, I think of those in terms of they're just two primaries. It's, it's more like, you know, the yellow ochre. Is, is just a yellow, obviously. And then the burnt sienna, it's more in the red family. Yeah, I guess you could say it's more in the orange family, but I treat it as a red. So I'm always thinking triads when I'm mixing. I don't think a lot about complements. I just think about, um, let's say I have a yellow and I'm, I'm painting with a yellow. I don't have to think about the complement. I just think about the other two uh, colors in the triad, and it makes the complement. So I'm going to I'm going to try to explain that just a little bit because there there sure. are a lot of newbies who who might be listening. So uh, essentially, 
you can make any color from three colors, right? Right, exactly. Okay. Right, yeah. so a, a blue, a red, and a yellow. So yeah. that's, when yep. you say triad, that's what you mean. Exactly, right. yeah. And, and when you say complement, tell them what that means. So um, if I'm working with a blue and I need the complement, which is orange, uh, which is directly across from blue on the color wheel, um, instead of thinking orange, I just think um, red and yellow. So... So I'm always going back to that idea of the triad, you know. Right. So, it, and and why and the reason it makes it simpler to think about is because uh, sometimes even after all these years of uh, of painting, like I, I, if somebody said said uh, what's the complement of blue green, I might have to think for a second, but I don't have to think at all about red, yellow, and blue. It's just you know one color and. Two more, you know. Now, for, for the, again, for the novice, why would someone add the complement or the opposite color into, let's say you've got a blue and you want to add an orange into it, why would you sure. do that? What's the purpose of that? Okay, so the purpose of that would be to, uh, to, to mute that blue, to get it to, I mean, you could look at, let's say, a shadow in the distance on a mountain, and it looks very blue to you. But if you put your, uh, like on, in my case, with what the colors I use, if I put my cerulean blue hue up there or my ultramarine blue, it's just going to be way too garish for for what I need. So I want to knock that blue back a little bit in in uh, in its intensity by adding the complement or the other two colors in the triad. Either way you think about it, it's the same thing. Yeah. So. And and you know, to, for, for the listener, there's not necessarily a right or wrong. I mean, this is a this is a taste thing. It's a personal preference thing. But there Absolutely. there is there is a kind of a you know kind of, kind of an unwritten standard that a lot of artists will use, where they want to kind of make their paintings are really uh, a lot of color variations of gray, um, and it mutes things back, and it just kind of overall has a little bit more tasteful feel. And, and yeah. again, going back to those early days of painting, you know, our, our tendency would be to make that sky just as bright blue as we possibly can, and yet making that sky have a little bit of that gray in it, that, that or grayed down from that orange, or sometimes just putting a little gray in it, 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 it makes it feel a little bit more as atmospheric, for instance. Yes. You know, years ago, uh, a friend of mine, a um, very good artist, sh uh, told me about something, and he was painting the side of a mountain, and it was at sunset, and he, he got a really uh, sparkling reddish-orange on this mountain, and um, he said, you know, look at this, this, the body of the color on this mountain. He said, most of it's toned down, it's warm, but it's kind of warm grays. And here and there, I stick some pure color on it, and, and all of a sudden, that mountain just lights up, you know. So it's it's that pure color next to that that muted color that um, just really sparkles. Yeah. But if you tried the same thing with the you know completely doing the side of that mountain with just that pure red or uh, orange right out of the tube, you wouldn't get the same effect. So I think yeah. it's kind of what you're saying there. Yeah. Are you a um, are you a lay it down, leave it alone, or are you a blender? Um, a little bit of both. I you know I'll, I'll try to put it down and leave it alone, but I you know things need to be adjusted some most of the time, and uh, there's always that fight between putting it down and leaving it and um, and overworking it. You know, so there's always that. There's always that uh, the competition, you know, <laughs> between those two ideas, and I, I guess knowing when to stop—that's a—that's a real skill, you know. Nobody knows uh, when to stop. It's it's yeah. <clears throat> it's like writing a book; it's never finished. You just have to, sometimes you have to put down your brush. Yeah, you know, and it can be a real problem, especially if you see a painting that. Uh, You've already sold, you know, and you you uh, you go in and you you look at it and you go, well, wow, I, 
I wish I could just put one little brush stroke on that thing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's good to get them out of your out of your studio, maybe you know, because of that. We're never satisfied as artists, I think. How did this journey begin for you? You know, um, it started very, very early. Um, I lived to, as I, I said earlier, my my dad was a New York City policeman. We lived in the Bronx in my early years, and I've got a kind of a vague recollection of the apartment that we lived in. It was just my mom, my sister, and I. And I remember my mom sitting me down in front of the TV this was back in the 1950s, and um, I, I watched. I used to watch this show called John Nagy uh, Draws yeah. the Landscape or something like that. It was yeah, John it, was, Nagy. it was John Nagy. It was a famous artist school, and yeah. uh, you can find it on YouTube. Yeah, so, you know, Mom was real instrumental in, be, in me becoming an artist. She, for some reason, she had this idea that I was an artist. And she would tell me, you're an artist, you know, and you see differently than other people. And she always told me that, you know, and uh, I don't know how she came up with that. but So I used to do that. And then she would, you know, as I grew, she would uh, always see to it that I had uh, drawing pencils, maybe one year at Christmas or a birthday or something. It would be drawing supplies. And, and then finally, when I, uh, I think I must have been around 12 or somewhere around there, one Christmas morning there was uh, paints under the Christmas tree, oil paints. And uh, I started from there. I actually started learning to paint by uh, uh, looking at books, you know, Walter T. Foster, that type of thing. And then after a while, I remember thinking, you know what, I, I need to get outside and do this. And I started going outside and painting. I, when, I, when we lived in uh, Crotonville, New York, it was near, well, actually, Ossining, New York, but we lived in a little suburb called Crotonville. So you were a child, you were a, what, a teenager? I was about 13 when I started going out painting on my own outdoors. You're a trendsetter, baby. You were you were way ahead of the few hundred thousand people who were doing it now. You know, but the thing is, uh, I, I did it for a while, and then I, I I wouldn't say I lost interest in it, but I but I had interest in other things, and I didn't do a lot of painting. Um, as a matter of fact, I didn't do any painting in high school. This was around the junior high age that I, I went out and uh, started painting on the river. But I remember distinctly that I. I used to come back from these trips down to the Croton River very, very deflated, you know, because I was I was out there doing it on my own, and I had zero instruction, you know. And uh, so I think um, that kind of made me, uh, I don't know, I put it on hold for a while. Mom used to really tease me about it, but uh, she used to say, you know, you're an artist, you've got to get back into it. And I'd tell her, yeah, I, I will. You know, at some point, I'm going to get back into it, Mom. And this was all during my high school, and you know, so. So when I did it come back, get... and when and how did it come back? Oh, okay, that's a that's a good one. Uh, I used to live in Ventura, California, and um, I was teaching, and I was also, uh, I had a job selling solar equipment. What were you teaching? And I was teaching uh, special ed adults at uh, Camarillo State Hospital. And um, on the side, I was selling solar equipment. And it just so happened that the um, solar uh, company that I worked for uh, had an office, and it was up above an Aaron Brothers art store. And I would go out for breaks, and I could smell, when people opened the door, I could smell this uh, linseed oil and the turpentine smell that was so familiar to me as a child, as a young young. <laughs> First. And it's it's and it's getting in your nose and saying, "Come back, come back." Yes, it, it literally drew me into the store. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I went down there one day, and I, I I thought to myself, "I wonder if there are any books that could teach you how to paint that, that were a little bit better, a little bit more in detail than those old uh, Foster books, which which were great to get me interested, but." 
you know, and I, I was I was looking through the books, and I, I came upon Emil Groupie's book, um, Groupie Paints the Landscape or something like that. And I started summing through that thing, and I was, like, hooked. I mean, it was like a thunderbolt hit me, you know, and I was like, I've got to do this. And I bought the book, and I went home, and I said, hey, hon, my wife, we were we weren't married very long, and I said, thinking about getting back into art do you mind if i go spend a bunch of money on art supplies <laughs> and she was all for it and uh, that's how i got back into it and i i'm just as excited now as i was back then and that was oh gosh that was almost 40 years ago well how did you make that transition though this is always a question for for people who are you know they're they're working in in a hospital teaching uh or they're doing something else you yeah. you obviously made the transition to being uh, making your living as an artist. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, it was uh, for for years and years. I I always had something on the side that I was doing. You know, I was either teaching or for a while there, my wife and I we managed a ski lodge up in Big Bear, California, and um, so I always had something else going. But I was always doing the art, too. I always considered the art my career, but the other things, you know, that was how I paid for the for the rent or the mortgage or whatever it was that I had to do. Um, I admire people that have done it uh, solely on their art. But for me, it was uh, during those years, it was uh, it would have been a little bit hard for me to emotionally to, you know, wonder if I was going to have enough money at the end of the month to, or at the beginning of the month, I should say, to make the mortgage payment. But yeah. uh, so I'm doing it full time now. But uh, you know, I it, back then it wasn't. Well, and I and I think that you know, trying if if you if you're going to do that, do what you love, you know, as much as you possibly can. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You, know, and, you can do both. Yeah. You just yeah. have to make time. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So you have, uh, I, I didn't mention this earlier, John, but you've written a lot of articles for Plein Air Magazine and Plein Air Today, um, you, and you're very popular. Your work is very popular. We always get a lot of, a lot of people reading them. Uh, pull an article out of your head that explains some tips or principles and talk to me about that. Oh, okay. You know, I was just thinking about one uh, just recently. Um, I came across a a, uh, a video it was online and it was uh, it was called the OODA loop, O O D A, and it was a, a talk by um, a guitarist named Jeff Skunk Baxter. Are you familiar with him from Steely no. Dan? Nope, I know Steely Dan, but nope. Yeah, he was the lead guitarist for Steely Dan, and interestingly enough. Uh, right now, he's a, he's like a consultant to the military right now. And um, anyway, he he talked about this thing called the OODA loop, O O D A, and it stands for observation, orientation, uh, decision, and then um, action. Action, yeah, action. So um, that really got me thinking, and I wrote an article about it. Gave credit to you know him for bringing it up in the first place, but. Uh, you know, it's like uh, when we paint, especially outdoors, um, I think there's a lot of parallels that, that happen between between what we're doing and this idea of the, the OODA loop, which is like, like I said, it's got military applications. So typically, maybe a, a, on the battlefield, a general will uh, take in uh, information. You know, that would be the observation phase and then from that observation they have to have some kind of orientation or synthesis of of what that information is before they can make a decision then they make the decision and then they act you know and i got to thinking that you know that's a lot like uh, what we do in the field it's like we we see we uh we have a way our brain processes what we're seeing and then we make a decision, and then here comes the brushstroke, you know. So, um, so if we get into problems with our paintings, the problem is always in the um, in the phase, you know. The observ- it's either the observation or the way we 
have learned to think about what we're the information that we're receiving visually. I know that sounds real academic and everything, but uh, it's just a way of looking at things. I I guess it's one way of saying it would be um, whenever there's a problem in our paintings, the problem is always somewhere between the tips of the shoes and the ends of the brush. <laughs> you know, it's not the painting. So. <laughs> anyway, um, so that that was an article I wrote for for Plein Air magazine for the for your newsletter and All right. uh, and and in terms of something that might have some some painting tips or ideas Oh uh you, from that article Well from any um, article Oh okay Well I think the the biggest thing you know it may and maybe it it doesn't sound like a practical thing but but really observation is the key for everything that we do You know it's um it's always it comes back to um, what we see is going to determine what we put down on the canvas. And, you know, I think sometimes, like, I do teach a lot of classes, and sometimes in those classes, you know, like a, a student will, will ask me to solve a problem for them in a way, but, you know, you can do that, but it's kind of like, giving a man a fish, you know that old saying? Right. If you give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, but if you if you teach him how to fish, you'll you'll he'll be uh, fed for a lifetime. And uh so I my my instruction in the classes and the workshops I teach kind of centers around this idea of observation and orientation now. Is that what you wanted or <laughs> does that help or well, I, you know, I know just pe people are always looking for, you know, something that, that they can go, oh, I'm going to try this at home. And, and Yeah. Yeah, sort of technique-based, you know, as, as opposed to the real heart and, and soul of, the, of getting to the, the point of, mm -hmm. of the, you know, creating a better painting. It really goes back to something else besides technique, you know. Technique is great, I mean, but... It's got its limitations. I'm going to see if I've just grabbed a book off my bookshelf here in the studio and see if I can tell you this. There's a, a fabulous book. I probably bought this 30 years ago. And it's a, an artist by the name of Carl Gustav Karras, who wrote this 1815 to 1924, and it's called Nine Letters oh. on Landscape Painting. And he talks, of, he talks about you know what more there is, and he says... Um, let's see if I can find this. I love those old books. Oh, they're you know they're 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 fabulous. It's essentially yeah. it's without getting into reading a bunch of boring text, and it is boring text because it was written in 1815. But he talks about how it says nature will never show itself in her true guise to anyone who makes a habit of observing through other men's glasses. And what that would mean is what? Uh, copying other people's work, copying master right. copies, etc. Least of all will she lift her veil and admit him to her mysteries. She remains mysterious in the full light of day. As everyone surely knows, it's no easy task to apprehend her truly. This has indeed always been the prerogative of genius. Who could fail to see, therefore, that now and forevermore the best of this cannot be taught? He goes on to say, essentially... Uh, it calls for silent meditation rather than technique. He talks about how the eye must be open to true and wondrous life of nature, and the hand must be trained to do the soul's bidding quickly, easily, and beautifully. This alone can aim the instruction in, in, in any of the pictorial, or aid in the instruction of any pictorial arts. We must train the eye to perceive nature in its divine essential life and its forms for whatever the eye perceives clearly and purely the hand cannot help but follow and develop in skill in other words go paint from nature <laughs> yeah yeah i love it I, I love it you know it sounds like uh I, he almost sounds like john f carlson or maybe you know carlson may have been influenced by him who knows who know? knows but, uh, yeah who knows? yeah but you know the, i i i think that you know we all get caught up in a little bit of of you know 
let's follow somebody else's technique or learn their their trick and you know I'm guilty as anybody because we produce a lot of videos uh, you know from a lot of artists but you know the there's nothing like just going out and immersing yourself in nature and that's I think that's the that's beauty so of what what it is we do is it's it's more than just painting yeah you know uh, I, I call that hero worship and um, actually it's it's a great thing to you know we all learn from others right I mean let's face it we like you said we we're all influenced by others and that's a that's a wonderful thing but at some point we have to stop asking ourselves how would so and so paint this whatever the rock this tree this sky and we have to start asking questions like what is the quality of the the light on that object what is the coloration what is what are the edges what are the values you know and when we start asking those questions that's when we make the real growth but it's certainly great to learn from other people don't get me wrong i just you know it's just uh, one of those things where at at some point we just have to change our thinking you know and that's the best thing that a student can do is uh start thinking in terms of all those things instead of, uh, you know, technique. Technique will follow, but... Uh, yeah, well, I think, you know, I think when you go out, though, you've got... That, I, I, I kind of ebb and flow between what I think is the right way to learn painting, and, um, you know, I think that, that it's best in a controlled environment to learn the things that you're uncomfortable with initially. You know, learn how yeah, to mix blue yeah. and green... Uh, or learn how to mix red and blue to make, you know, to make a, a purple and and kind of get those chores out of the way. Learn how to handle a paintbrush. Learn how to clean it. Yeah. And yep. and you know how to deal Pretty with important. those kinds of things, so yeah. that you're not fighting those battles. Because when you go outdoors, you're fighting all the other battles and chasing light and dealing with wind and bugs right. and you know sounds right. sounds absolutely horrible, but it's of course absolutely great. So if you can get yep. some things to the point of second nature, I think that's that's going to aid you. Would you agree? Absolutely. You know, and I, I think back to one of my very first workshops, and the, and the way it went was uh, every student in the room copied what the teacher did, and that was great for a very for a first experience because that was just sort of like here's the mechanics of it, you guys uh, do this, and then but then I realized, you know. After two days of that, you know, I I went up to the instructor because the workshop was over, and I said, well, I guess now I need to get out there because we were doing seascapes. And I said, um, i got to get out there on the rocks myself. And he said, you're right. You know, that's that's where you take it from here, you know. So like you said, painting from nature, so important. Absolutely. So uh, one thing I've been asking a lot of people lately is about any memorable experiences when out painting. I've got a few. Um, one time I was painting downtown Salt Lake, and uh, I was. Is that uh, where you live? I live in Salt Lake now. Yeah, yeah. yeah I lived there for and, I lived there for um, 1980 to 1986. Really? Yeah, huh. I own, I owned a radio station or two out there. Well, that was before I got up here. I came up in '91, right. off and on. My wife is from here, but uh, I was downtown doing one of those downtown paintings and. All of a sudden, I look up, and here's this little guy. He's probably 10 years old, and he's standing in front of me, and he's holding up a dollar bill. And uh, at first, I was thinking, I wonder what he wants. You know, is he trying to buy the painting or something? Or So I asked him, uh, what's that for? And he goes, my mom said to give it to you. <laughs> so I guess he thought I was uh, like a street musician or something like that, or, uh, you know, somebody doing a show for people and I was taking tips you know you know what a great so, idea you know when you're next time you go to New York City when you're out painting put a hat out and put a dollar in the hat there you go. <laughs> we're, we're gonna have to do a whole session on that in art marketing boot camp at the convention how to get tips <laughs> <laughs> it was great I loved it poor kid you know he was just my mom said to give this to you <laughs> yeah uh, I love I, I love it when kids come up and are curious and and I like to, with their parents' permission, I like to say, can I, 
teach them a couple of things. Because if I can get that paintbrush in their hand and show them, you know, I'll take their brush and I'll, I'll say, okay, here's how we're going to mix a color. Now I want you to take the brush and just lay it in there. I, you know, they can't ruin my painting. I can scrape it down later if I have to. But I, I love, to I love interacting with kids in that environment because I'm hoping that maybe, you know, they'll go home and say, hey, mom, can I, uh, can I try this? Yeah, yeah, that is that's uh, that is awesome to be able to do that. I got a buddy who does that too. Uh, I don't know if you know Steve Stoffer, but he uh, he routinely lets kids paint on his paintings. And uh, I'm not that brave, but uh, <laughs> he does it all the time. Any uh, any other thoughts about uh, memorable moments painting? Well, one time I was um, in Midway, uh, Utah, and I was doing a demonstration out in the middle of a field, and this billy goat walks up, and he sticks his head in my trash bag. And that darn billy goat, he didn't take his head out of the trash bag for one hour. Really? And Yeah, and I, I had no place I, to put my, my tissues or my paper towels, whatever. And uh, so I opened up my backpack, and I started putting them in there, you know, because this billy goat wasn't going to take his head out of there, and he didn't, you know. Matter of fact, I almost had to send him away with the bag attached to his head, but finally he pulled it out and he left. But <laughs> it was it was really strange because I had twenty people behind me watching doing I, this. I, uh, yeah, that reminds demo. that reminds me of a story. I was in Russia painting in a small Russian village. As a matter of fact, I'm putting together a trip to this small Russian village, and we're going to make that one of our events in the future. And um, uh, that's awesome. And so out in the middle of this Russian village, which is in the middle of nowhere, there's no power, no water. You know, the the women are carrying buckets of water to bring water for their house. And, and you know, the, the, it's, ju- they're just, it's just really beautiful. Anyway, I'm out there painting, and this giant, giant cow, which is wandering in the streets, just walks up to me and stares at me. And he just stood there for a while, and then he turned around. And then he left. And one of the guys I was painting with is a Russian artist, very well-known, famous Russian artist. And he said, you're lucky. I said, what do you mean? He said, he nudged me. The other day I was out here, he said, he nudged me out of the way, and he licked all the paint off my palate. <laughs> oh, that is too much. Too much. So that somebody will get a little lead in their, uh, in their steak. Yeah. That reminds me of a story that uh, Susan Gallagher uh, told me. And it was a. It was an, one of the articles in uh, Plein Air. Uh, funny stories from different artists, and I, I had a bunch of them. They gave me stories. Uh, Clyde Aspavig, um, Matt Smith. They all have some stories in there. Thing, funny things that happened to them. And uh, but yeah, she uh, she had a cow do the same thing, and it uh, had had its head inside her her trash bag, and it came out and it. She said it looked like it had red lipstick. Huh. And, uh, and then uh, she drove away, and then a little bit later she came by, and she said, and darn it, that cow was out in the middle of a field, and wouldn't you know there was a couple of bulls following it. It looked like it had red lipstick on, and there were these bulls following this cow. So <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we know it works. Don't even, <laughs> don't even any, need any research. Well, John, this has been a pleasure. It's been fun having you on the Plein Air Podcast Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. It's been great. Good talking to you, Eric. Thanks again to John Hughes. Thanks for a really interesting interview. I enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Anyway, got some marketing ideas. You ready? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your marketing questions. You can, you can touch on anything. Yeah, there's no limit. Uh, just email them to me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. A question from Aaron in Chicago. By the way, Chicago has an excellent Plein Air Painters group. Say hi to everybody there. Uh, hi, everybody in Chicago. Uh, Aaron says, what's the best way for me to know my buyer? You talked about it in one of your webinars, but... How does that help me sell my art, and how do I get to know them? Well, Aaron, there's a marketing foundational principle. Foundational principles are big. And this one says you have to know your market. You have to know who who your market is. Who is your target 
audience and what do they need most? And, and the best way to do that is to ask them. Now, selling art is a little bit different than selling shoes or selling any other product, but art tends to be a little bit subjective and have individual appeal. But yet, if you were to look at the demographics, most art is purchased by people between 40 and 60 years old and the majority between 50 and 60 years old. That tends to be where the money is. They've got, um, they've got money at that time. You know, their kids are starting to be out of college and, and they, they're more interested in art than ever in their spending. But there are people, of course, all age groups. Uh, so 40 to 60 year old is broad. It's a family reunion, but it still tends to be uh, what the buying, where the buying takes place. And you also want to understand, and this is not trying to be sexist in any way, most art buying is heavily influenced by women. If there's a couple and that painting is going to hang in the house, and typically, not always, that woman will uh, maybe be the one who's in charge of decorating and may say, look, that, that painting's not hanging over my purple couch. So uh, they do have influence. And of course, that's not true of all kinds of couples, but it, it could be true. And so get to know your audience. What I like to do is I like to understand who's buying my paintings and why they're buying my paintings. And so if I get an opportunity, for instance, if I'm at the gallery during a show, somebody buys it, I'll meet the buyers. I'll try to learn a little bit about them. Where do they live? Where are they from? What kind of business are they in? What kind of jobs do they have? Uh, what kind of homes do they live in? Do they have vacation homes? You know, those things give me clues. And then I also ask, you know, what is it about this painting that spoke to you? And, and oftentimes I'll hear patterns and people will say, well, you know, I really like the, the colors. Or the one I hear a lot is it reminds me of X, Y, Z, something nostalgic usually. You know, oftentimes I'll hear, you know, that, that reminds me of where I grew up or that reminds me of a place we lived when I was little. So look for those kinds of things because those might give you clues on what to paint, but also things that you can say. Because if you're in a, an opportunity to influence people, you can, you can say, you know, does that painting remind you of anything like, a, you know, place that you grew up or something like that. So use those triggers. Also look for commonalities in the people who are buying things because that'll tell you kind of where to reach out. I've noticed lately uh, with my paintings, I've been getting a, a lot of buyers who are doctors. And those doctors all happen to live in the local community where my gallery is, most of them. And so would that give me a clue as a marketing opportunity, maybe a way to, to reach doctors somehow or a way to uh, invite doctors, all the doctors in town to an opening or something. Just kind of use your brain and uh, those things, those commonalities will point out things in your marketing. The next question comes from Darla. Hey, Darla. It's kind of like saying, hey, darling. Darla in Flagstaff, Arizona. Darla says, <laughs> sorry. Uh, Darla says, I know I have to be productive to sell my art, but sometimes I just don't feel motivated. How can I stay focused on both painting and marketing? Well, you're probably not going to want to hear this, Darla, but there's a lot of answers to it. And, and I guess it really depends on what's really important to you and what's not. If it's not about a need, you know, in other words, if selling paintings is not meaning you're going to have to pay the mortgage it's just extra money that you're going to have. It probably isn't important to you. And so I like to think in terms of goals and priorities. Let me give you an example. I set annual goals. I have three top annual goals. And then I have three, tops for, three top goals for each month. Some of those goals relate to the top three goals of the year uh, in terms of the projects that I have to do to reach those goals. And I have weekly goals. And so uh, until my top three goals are met for the week, I don't leave the office. You know, I don't push them off into the following week because if I don't get those done, I'm never going to get anything done. So every goal relates to the top goals. Now, if I'm not working on things that don't reach my goals, it's mostly a complete waste of time. Now, there's things you have to do. You got to take out the garbage. You know, you got to pick up the kids. You got to deal with, you know, health issues or whatever. But 
I try to keep most of my time focused on those goals because it's real easy to go, well, I should do this project or I've got this idea. Those shiny objects will get in the way of your success. I know I'm the shiny object king. Success Magazine even said that about me. And I've had to learn to overcome that because those shiny objects kind of get in the way of my success. And so um, if, if it's a financial thing, let's say, for instance, you know you have to generate I'm going to use this number because it's easily divided. Let's say you know you have to survive and you have to generate $120,000 a year or you can't survive and pay your mortgage and your bills. That has to be one of your goals. If your monthly goal will then be $12,000, right? Or $10,000. $10,000 because you've got 12 months. So $10,000 and then you divide that by four weeks and, you know, that's $2,500. And then you might even want to break that into a daily goal and you just tell yourself, I'm not leaving here today till I figured out how to sell that. But it depends on how motivated you are. Daily goals keep me motivated. I know that I have to do certain things each day to survive and that I don't leave the office till they're done. Sometimes it means a long day. I also sometimes will break my week into a plan. So it, I tell people, I think you ought to spend 20% of your time on marketing. So if you're working five days a week, then you got to spend one day a week on your marketing or you got to spend so many hours a day on your marketing and pay attention to it and force yourself to do it. And sometimes that's what it takes to be motivated. Now, there are days when I'd rather sleep in and not work. I'd rather not go to work. I'd rather play my guitar or go painting or, you know, just chill. Uh, but I don't do that very often because it always puts me further behind. I think routines are critical and no matter what, I stick to my routines. I get up every day at the same time. I get up, I feed my kids, I drive them to school, I go to the gym for an hour, I come home, I get ready for work, I meditate, I read the Bible, I do the things that I try to do every morning. And so gym is critical for me because it raises my dopamine levels, it gets my health, uh, keeps my health good, but also it makes me feel like working. So if I'm in a down mood, if I can get myself to the gym or at least to take a walk, it puts dopamine into my system, makes me feel better, and uh, that's helpful. So look for a routine. Motivation is everything. Also ask yourself, what happens if I don't do this? And let's say you don't have to make that money, but you want something. So everything can be tied to something. So let's say you're telling yourself, well, I don't have to sell paintings because my wife or my husband has a job, but I'd like to get a new car. And to be able to get a new car, I got to come up with $30,000. And to do $30,000, I got to, you know, I want to get one in three months. Well, okay, so now you got to do 10000 a month. you got to get busy, and you got to focus on that. So break everything down. Start with a big goal. Break it down into little bitty pieces. There's also another trick that applies, and that is a trick that I use when I'm writing. The old adage was, if you can't think of what you're going to write, just sit down and start writing anything. It's gibberish, writing a note, writing a letter, anything. And, and that warms up your brain, and next thing you know, you kick in and you're able to write. Well, I... I think that the same would be true for anything. You know, if you're, if you're not feeling like marketing, just force yourself to sit down and do your marketing. It'll make a major difference because you'll eventually just kind of kick in and then you'll kind of forget you weren't motivated. Anyway, I hope that helps. That's been the Marketing Minute. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. A reminder to check out the plein air convention and get your seat before they're gone, before the price increase on February 14th. You can get that at plenairconvention.com. And also a reminder to enter the plein air salon competition. There's 30 grand in cash and prizes, all, actually all cash prizes, and uh, you can enter at plenairsalon.com. I have this blog I do on Sunday mornings. If you've not seen it, I talk about philosophies and life and art and ethics and a lot of different things. I started writing it for my kids so that I could teach them some lessons I wanted to impart. And I started blogging about it, and it's up to about a quarter million people listening and reading it now. Anyway, if you're not a member of that, it's free. It's called Sunday Coffee. If you can go to Coffee with Eric, that's me, go to coffeewitheric.com, and you can sign up for free. It'll come every Sunday. This is always fun. We'll do it again next week. And uh, in the meantime, uh, get out there and paint. 
My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. It is a big, beautiful world, and you need to get out and paint it. And by the way, if you're just learning Plein Air painting, you might want to come to the Plein Air Basics course the day before the Plein Air Convention. It will help you so much. If I'd have had that, I would have saved five or seven years. So think about that. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening. <laughs>